Following the inconclusive battle of Beneventum Pyrrhus, the legendary Greek king, returned to his homeland of Epirus. However, he left behind a garrison at Tarentum to maintain his presence in Italy. Unfortunately, the prolonged and bloody war had drained his financial and military resources, leaving him in a vulnerable position. In an attempt to bolster his reputation and revive his fortunes, Pyrrhus decided to declare war on King Antigonus, the second Gonadas of Macedon. Pyrrhus' military campaign was initially successful, with his forces ravaging parts of the country and defeating Antigonus in the fierce Battle of the Aeolus. This victory forced Antigonus to flee to Thessaloniki, where he sought refuge under the protection of his navy. With Antigonus out of the way, Pyrrhus gained control over most of Macedon and Thessaly and declared himself the new king of Macedon. When Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus, seized the Macedonian throne, a Spartan prince named Cleonymus approached him with a request to help him capture Sparta. Cleonymus, who was serving as an officer in Pyrrhus' army, convinced the Epirot king to aid him in his plot to install him on the Spartan throne. Pyrrhus was receptive to Cleonymus' appeals and agreed to assist him. To accomplish this, Pyrrhus assembled an army consisting of 27,000 men, which included 25,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and 24 war elephants. The size of Pyrrhus' expedition suggests that he saw an opportunity to extend his hegemony into the Peloponnese and secure Sparta as an ally. Alternatively, some scholars believe that Pyrrhus invaded the Peloponnese to cut off any support that Antigonus was still receiving from the southern Greek polis. Upon arriving in the Peloponnese, Pyrrhus received a warm welcome in Achaea before continuing his march towards Megalopolis. Here he was met by ambassadors from various cities, including Sparta, Messene, Athens, and the Achaean League. It appears that Pyrrhus had received support for his invasion from some of Sparta's neighboring cities, such as Elise, Megalopolis, and some Achaean cities, which would benefit from reduced Spartan power. When the Spartan emissaries inquired about his intentions, Pyrrhus managed to deceive them by claiming that he aimed to liberate the cities still held by Antigonus and send his sons to Sparta for education in the Agoge. After the ambassadors withdrew, Pyrrhus advanced into Laconia, ravaging the territory of the Spartan Pyrrhosi by following the Eurotas River south. Pyrrhus' deceitful actions sparked outrage in Sparta, prompting the dispatch of more ambassadors to address his perfidious behavior. When the invading army entered Laconia, Sparta was found to be only lightly guarded. The bulk of the Spartan army had accompanied their leader Arius on a campaign in Crete, where they were providing support to the polis of Gorton. With the Spartan forces away from home, Pyrrhus saw an opportunity to attack Sparta with ease. Upon arriving outside the city in the evening, Cleonymus, one of Pyrrhus' advisors, suggested launching an immediate assault to capitalize on the lack of defenders. However, Pyrrhus was hesitant as he was concerned about the damage that his Gallic soldiers would cause if they were to enter the city at night. Despite expecting no resistance, Pyrrhus ordered his army to set up camp and waited until morning to enter Sparta. The sudden appearance of the Epirote army before the city of Sparta caught the Spartans off guard. The majority of the Lacedaemonian Gerousia being in favor of sending the women to Crete for their safety, but Arachidamia, the former queen and grandmother of the Europonted king, Eudemidas II, opposed the idea and ensured that the Spartan women would stay behind to assist with the city's protection. Once the arrangements for the women were made, the Spartans began to reinforce the settlement's defenses. The defenders were aware that the Epirotes had brought elephants, and in response, the older men and women dug a trench parallel to Pyrrhus' camp. To hinder the enemy's advance, wagons were sunken into the ground at the flanks of the trench. The trench was an impressive obstacle, spanning 800 feet in length, with a depth of 6 feet and a width of 9 feet. Pausanias recounts that the Spartan garrison, despite being meager in number, received assistance from allies who had arrived from Argos and Messene during the siege. Additionally, the Spartans sent messengers to both Arius, summoning him back to Sparta, and to Antigonus, seeking assistance, despite the fact that Sparta and Macedon had historically been enemies.
if we are victorious and live, I will sacrifice to Zeus and Ares for their favor and help in our defense. But we mortals must do our parts as well. Fight with honor, and all will be well. As the first light of day broke, the Epirode army began to prepare for an attack on the Spartans who had taken up defensive positions behind their trench. The Spartan soldiers were encouraged by their women to hold their ground. The besiegers, under the personal leadership of Pyrrhus, launched an assault on the Spartan defenses, but were unable to secure a foothold in the face of Spartan counterattacks. The trench proved to be an impassable obstacle for the Epirote army, frustrating their efforts to break through. In an attempt to outflank the Spartans, Pyrrhus sent a force of 2,000 Gauls and some elite Caonians, led by his son Ptolemy, to go around the trench. However, they found their path blocked by the wagons which the Lacedaemonians had sunken deep into the soil. These wagons not only hindered the Epirote assault, but also impeded the Spartan efforts to repel the foray. Despite this, the Gauls eventually managed to remove some of the wagons, allowing them to make a break for the city. However, the future king of Sparta, Acrotatus, saw the danger and exploited a series of depressions in the terrain to lead a force of 300 men undetected against the Epirote rear. This surprise maneuver threw the Gauls into a panic, forcing them to abandon their attempt to enter the city and turn around to confront the attack to their rear. A fierce battle ensued, resulting in heavy casualties on both sides. In the end, the Epirote flanking group was pushed back into the trench with many of their soldiers dead or wounded. Pyrrhus was unable to penetrate the Lacedaemonian defenses, so when night descended, he retreated to his camp. As per Plutarch's account, Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus, had a dream that night which left him bewildered. In his dream, he saw Sparta being struck by thunderbolts that were coming from his own hand, which set the city ablaze. While Pyrrhus and most of his counselors took it as a positive sign that they would be able to seize Sparta by storm, his trusted friend Lysimachus warned him against it. Lysimachus pointed out that places that are struck by thunderbolts are usually avoided and that perhaps Pyrrhus was not destined to conquer Sparta. However, Pyrrhus was too optimistic and confident in his interpretation of the dream, and he prepared his soldiers for another assault, buoyed by the belief that the dream was a portentous sign. As the Epirotes launched a renewed offensive next day, the Spartans stood firm and held their defenses with utmost determination. Despite their shortage of manpower, the Spartan women were actively involved in the defense, providing missile support to the front line and tending to the wounded. They also ensured that the defenders were well fed and hydrated. To overcome the advantage of the Spartans' superior position, the Epirotes started to fill up the trench with a range of materials, including the bodies of their fallen comrades. However, the Spartans were quick to react and understood the importance of maintaining their defensive obstacles. They worked tirelessly to hinder the besiegers' efforts and prevent them from gaining any ground. Despite the challenges, the Spartans remained resolute, determined to hold their ground at all costs.
As the Spartan counterattack commenced against the Epirotes who had filled the trench, King Pyrrhus decided to take matters into his own hands and lead a charge against the Spartan lines. With a fierce determination, he mounted his horse and galloped towards the trench, over the wagons and into the city, accompanied by a group of his trusted companions. The sudden onslaught of Pyrrhus caught the defenders off guard, leading to panic and confusion amongst them. However, the tide of battle soon turned against Pyrrhus when his horse was wounded by a deadly javelin that pierced its belly. The horse's fall threw the king to the ground, causing his companions to lose their composure and fall into disarray. The Spartans took advantage of this opportunity and launched a barrage of missiles at Pyrrhus' comrades, felling many of them. Despite the deaths of many of his guards, Pyrrhus managed to crawl to safety with the help of his loyal soldiers. Pyrrhus had hoped to capture the city of Sparta, but his plans were foiled by the arrival of reinforcements. Upon learning of Pyrrhus' intentions, Antigonus Gennatas, the king of Macedon, sent his general, Amanius the Phocian, from Corinth with a group of skilled mercenaries to aid the Lacedaemonians. And to further strengthen the defense, Spartan king Arius arrived with 2,000 men from Crete. The arrival of these brave men greatly reduced the pressure on the Spartan forces. As a result, non-combatants were able to withdraw from the front line, leaving the defenders better positioned to face the Epirote army. After receiving reinforcements, the Spartan army and their Macedonian allies braced themselves for the next onslaught by Pyrrhus on their fortified trenches. The increased number of adversaries only strengthened Pyrrhus' resolve to capture the city, and he launched yet another attack on the trenches. However, his efforts proved futile, and he suffered even more casualties. This latest failure finally convinced Pyrrhus that continuing with the siege was pointless, and he made the difficult decision to withdraw his troops and lift the siege. King Pyrrhus had planned to spend the winter season in Laconia. He intended to use this time to prepare for a fresh attack on Sparta. To achieve this goal, he ordered his army to start ravaging the surrounding areas. However, Pyrrhus received an emissary from Aristeas, a prominent citizen of the city of Argos, which was situated in the Peloponnese region. Aristeas sought Pyrrhus' assistance to overthrow the regime of Aristippus, which was supportive of Antigonus and the Macedonians. Pyrrhus saw this as an opportunity to capture Argos and decided to withdraw his forces from Laconia, directing them towards Argolis in the north. As Pyrrhus' army retreated, they were relentlessly pursued by the Spartans, who were under the command of Arius. The Spartans used various tactics, such as setting ambushes and occupying key positions along the Epirote line of retreat, to inflict significant losses on Pyrrhus' rearguard consisting of Gauls and Molossians. The situation became dire as the panic and morale of Pyrrhus' rearguard started crumbling under the relentless attacks of the Spartans. In a desperate attempt to regain control, Pyrrhus sent his son Ptolemy to take command. His hope was that Ptolemy's presence would boost the morale of his rearguard and buy enough time to extricate the rest of his army from the narrow pass they were marching through. 
However, the situation only worsened as the battle intensified around Ptolemy's position. A picked Spartan band, led by Evaclus, attacked Ptolemy's troops, resulting in his death. The remaining troops were no match for the triumphant Spartans and were quickly overwhelmed. Upon receiving news of his son's death and the disintegration of his rearguard, Pyrrhus charged the Spartans with his Molossian cavalry, determined to avenge his son's death. In the ensuing fight, Pyrrhus killed Evaclus with his own hand before destroying the rest of his picked Spartan troops. With the defeat of Evaclus' force, Pyrrhus was finally able to withdraw the rest of his army from Laconia. The battle had been a fierce and bloody one, with both sides suffering significant losses.